is this is this is really really important for you to understand what i did is i went through because the philosophy for wall street for financial advisors is to say listen mr and mrs client we understand that the market's going to have its ups it's going to have its downs but the bottom line is if you look at the history the average return of the dow jones industrial average is 7.1 percent so we can look at that and we can conservatively say that at 7.1 percent uh, if you buy and you hold and you just ride it out and let it roll for you know 30, 40 years, you're gonna be good to go. Now, I'm showing a simplified version of this because obviously I put a lump sum up front, it's gonna ride out, um, but the principle here is what I'm trying to show. And I have a much longer period of time, 1929 to, uh, to 2021, you're talking a long period of time for the interest to accumulate. So if you were to compress that to a 30 year period, Obviously, uh, depending on what 30 year period we're talking about here, the results vary. But what I'm talking about, the, the, the point that I'm trying to convey is expectation versus reality. Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180. And for this video, we're gonna be talking about the average rate of return, um, why it's a lie, uh, why it really has nothing to do with you reaching financial success. And ultimately what I'm gonna do in this process is kind of show you uh, some math and facts behind the fact that when I tell you two of the biggest lies that you're told is that you should buy and hold for a long period of time and that the market is just gonna average out and that works to your advantage. So the buy and hold proponents out there, the people that love that idea, I'm gonna prove mathematically why that why that is a just laughable uh, joke and pretty sad and why, in my opinion, it should be un it is an unethical and it should be, quite frankly, illegal for advisors to base projections on average rates of return based on past market performance, right? So I'm gonna get into that. And you know, the the idea that the younger you are, the more risk you can take, uh, or should take, I should say, um, is, is just, just completely out in left field and is gonna hold you back from reaching financial freedom faster. Now, speaking of financial freedom, guess what? I just got my copies of my books in. I'm super excited about this. They just got here. Um, here's the deal. If you wanna get a copy of this book, you can go uh, to cashflowhackingbook.com. There's gonna be a link in the description below. You can go check that out. Um, if you wanna reach financial freedom in around a decade or less, um, I'm telling you, go read this book. In the meantime, uh, you can also, by the way, go to Amazon, get it for 20 bucks, or you can go just pay shipping and handling uh, on, on the book funnel there, and it will it will get, get shipped right out to you as soon as possible here. So anyway, let's get into this. So what I did is um, I put together Three spreadsheets, and the, the spreadsheets, this is gonna be for all you geeks out there like me who, who really wanna understand the nuances of this. So what I wanna do is actually share my screen here and show you the calculations and walk through kind of the moving parts of why the average rate of return really is a myth, why it's, it's you know, is, is deceptive really, and it's actually, if you bank on those projections, it's gonna hurt you. I'm a big believer that, um, anything we measure improves and you know also that it's the things that we misunderstand um that that we don't expect to happen to us are the things that throw us off our game it's one of the reasons i don't like index universal life insurance and i love whole life insurance is because of the fact that it's not that i don't like index universal life it's that i think it's one of the most missold if not the most missold financial product in the world simply because the performance never matches the illustration. And I think that's where the danger comes in. And that's gonna make a lot more sense as I go through this projection for the average rate of return. All right, so what I did here is I did a, um, I have three tabs down here. So just full transparency, you'll see these tabs. Um, and what I did here is you can see here on the left columns, I got the year, and then I have the rate of return right here, right? And so, oops. Yep, so I have the rate of return. And what happens is you can go down through here and you can see rate of return every year after every year, um, year over year, there's some big years, 18.7, 7.25, 22.34, negative 5.63. So it is what it is, we got some negative years, uh, we have a lot of big years, and, and if you go back in the past, there's some big negative years. But the idea here is to understand, and this is just conceptual here, is that the average you can see average, I'm just showing the math here, the average, this is the calculation that's being run, right? 
is 7.10. So that's saying the average rate of return from 1929 to 2021 was 7.1%. Now, what I want to do is this is this is really really important for you to understand. What I did is I went through because the philosophy for Wall Street for financial advisors is to say, listen, Mr. and Mrs. client, we understand that the market's going to have its ups, it's going to have its downs. But the bottom line is, if you look at the history, the average return of the Dow Jones industrial average is 7.1%. So we can look at that and we can conservatively say that at 7.1%, uh, if you buy and you hold and you just ride it out and let it roll for you know, 30, 40 years, you're gonna be good to go. Now I'm showing a simplified version of this because obviously I put a lump sum up front, it's gonna ride out. Um, but the principle here is what I'm trying to show. And I have a much longer period of time, 1929 to, uh, to 2021, you're talking a long period of time for the interest to accumulate. So if you were to compress that to a 30 year period, obviously, uh, depending on what 30 year period we're talking about here, the results vary. But what I'm talking about, the, the, the point that I'm trying to convey is expectation versus reality. Once again, this is why I don't like IULs because people expect them to perform you know, out of this world like the illustration shows and the reality is something far, far worse typically, right? For, for most scenarios, uh, if, if you're dealing with 99% of the agents out there that I've, that I've ever talked to and they, they think that the illustration rates in an IUL are, are going to be, uh, you know, the average return of 6% or 6.4%. If you have an IUL agent that's running an illustration rate showing you that it's going to average out to be about four and a half percent, then, you know, uh, then maybe that's something you could roll with as far as, as far as the results go. But anyway, talking about getting back to this, uh, spreadsheet here, what I did then was I said, okay, at 7.1%, this is what they would do. They would say, okay, it's gonna be up, it's gonna be down. Let's just assume it's 7.1% every year because this is the buy and hold strategy, right? Like, yeah, we, we're not gonna show those big years of 30% returns and 25% returns, uh, but we're also not gonna show the down years. We're just gonna show it averaging out. So you can see here what I did is I invested $5,000 right out of the gate, right in this column. And at a 7.1% return, you got 53.55. The next year, you got 53.55. Starting the year, you end with 57.35. And it's just gonna keep compounding because that's how it's gonna average out. So the average rate of return, you could see over a period of time, uh, compounding by 1964, uh, you got 59,000. You breach 100,000 in 1972. Uh, and, and it's just gonna keep growing. And by the time we hit 2021, about 92 years later, uh, we have two million nine hundred forty-seven thousand seventy-two bucks. So almost three million dollars, right? So this is the idea that they would project you. And once again, they say, "Hey, it's going to have its ups, it's going to have its downs, but it's going to have a 7.1 percent average." And so we're going to run this model, and that's what they do. And what it's important to understand is now we're going to get into the real performance, right? And this is really, really, I, I mean, I, I can't stress enough that based on the order of returns and based on what's happening here, you can see 1929 obviously uh, was a financial crisis. It was negative, 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 negative. So we started off in a bad time frame, but the reality is that could happen to anybody, anytime, any place. Um, and as it's averaged out over the years, it doesn't change the fact that it's still a 7.1% average because then we have times where it's 18 plus, 17, 14, 10 positive, uh, you know, 38 positive, 17 positive. So we have some big years and that's what averages everything out. And then you got the 80s, which are crazy, 19%, 20%, 27%, 22%. 26%. So the 80s were a monstrous uh, performance time, right? But here's the bottom line. Because of the fact that you interrupt with negative performing years, right? And you have these negative years and you have the like the dot-com bubble in 2000, 2001, 2002, right? And, and then you have the housing crisis in 2008. This is what I'm saying. The average didn't change here right? The average rate of return in the market in that time frame is, is exactly what I based 
this average on because like you can see here, the calculation, the formula, I didn't change that, right? You could see here, this is the formula. It's the average of those cells. I'm showing you right here. I'm showing you uh, the formula, the calculation, the math, right? But here's the deal. The real performance, what that $5,000 actually grew to was $605,000, right? So remember, if we grew it and you were being sold by me as your financial advisor, as a classic traditional financial advisor that was trying to convince you that, hey, listen, Mr. and Mrs. Client, you, you just gotta buy and hold, it's gonna average out, don't let the down years scare you, let's just average it out 7.1%, it's all gonna be good. And if you do that in this scenario, I have a crystal ball, let's say you had this time horizon of $5,000 would grow to 2.9, almost $3 million, right? But then you got there and you were expecting that you had almost $3 million, but you wound up with only $605,000, right? And this doesn't even account for the loss of purchasing power that that $605,000 would have over a 92 year period of time, right? Like it's kind of crazy when you think about that, right? So um, here's the deal though, it gets worse because that's just pure market returns. Now you go into the fact that we have fund fees and management fees. And, and when I combine those up and they could be higher than this, I think 1.5% average between the two is, is pretty clean. It's pretty, pretty reasonable for most scenarios. Um, what happens is it actually has a negative impact because on negative years, it makes the losses even worse. And on positive years, it takes away, you know, so, because you're paying those management fees no matter what. So remember we've gone, I'm just going to go back through here. You went from this strategy thinking you were going to have near, near $3 million. You wound up, you thought based on the real return, you're going to wind up with $605,000. But this is gonna be what you actually wind up with. And why? Because this is what, how fees impact your growth of your account, right? Because you gotta pay these fees every single year, no matter what, and there's no avoiding them. I hate to break it to you, but there's just no avoiding them. And so as we go down here, I'm just gonna get right to the end of it. And once again, just to show, I, I haven't changed any of the math, right? It, it, it's all here. Um, the numbers line out, it is what it is. Um, and I can show you the, the formula, the calculation here. Um, you know, it's right here. You can see that for everybody who wants to see that for anybody that's questioning my math here, it's there. Um, you can check out the formula and it makes sense. Um, everything is, is, is been quadruple checked. And so here's the bottom line though, because of the fees, you went from having $605,000 at the retirement to 155,000, right? So that's $450,000 in extra opportunity costs because of the fees that you experienced over those years. So as you can see here, like the math just works out. You went from thinking you had nearly 3 million, uh, you know, to the performance being just over 600,000, but at the end of the day, after fees, after everything, the real money in your pocket was only gonna be about 155,000, right? Like, or 150-ish thousand, 155,000, yeah. And so so when you, when you look at those numbers, this is my problem. It's all about expectation management, right? And, and this doesn't even account for the fact that $155,000, when, when you account for inflation over those years, is really probably about, you know, not much more than $10,000 worth of purchasing power back then. So you really only doubled the value of your money over a 92 year period of time following that philosophy, right? Following that strategy. And this is the problem. This is why I say 401ks are the greatest failed financial experiment of all time. And this is why I'm, I get so frustrated, you know, listening to the Dave Ramsey's of the world talking about making people millionaires, right? Like that, that idea worked when Dave Ramsey started, you know, and when Susie Orman was starting these conversations back in 1990, when having a million dollars actually meant something. But the bottom line is having a million dollars now in retirement doesn't get anybody anywhere. Like it's, it's almost inconsequential. Like it, it's not going to solve any problems. A million dollars, um, especially if you're saving now and your goal is to have a million dollars 20, 30 years from now, th think about like the impact inflation and everything is gonna have on that. So it's not, you need to think about money differently. You need to think about the fact that the average rate of return is a lie. You need to really understand the moving parts to how your money is gonna grow and how you can control that and the different 
elements that you can implement in your life to regain financial control and, and to really achieve a more predictable result. And that's why I wrote this book. So once again, go check it out in the description below if you wanna get a copy of it. But ultimately, what it comes down to is, is just the fact that the system right now is not set up for you to win. And if you wanna to get to where you wanna go on a more predictable basis, you need to not do what 95% of the people in this world are doing because they're not getting the results that they want in their life. So if you have any questions, go ahead and comment in the comment section below. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, click the bell, that way you get notified every time I launch a new video. And as always, have a blessed, inspirational day, and we'll talk to you on the next video. See ya.